Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Ness Hacker. This is part two of my Final Fantasy Better Shops ROM hack coverage, and this time I'll show you how to trace subroutines and make minor changes to the game using FCE UX. Let's go! In the last video, I explained the goal of the hack, showed how the CPU memory space was structured, and wrapped up with a little RAM hacking to find some important variables. If you haven't watched it yet, I suggest pausing this video and doing so before proceeding. For this video, I'm going to focus on how we can use the information that we've already gathered to find and trace specific subroutines related to shops in the game's machine code. I'll begin by discussing a bit about how programs actually run on the NES, and then I'll show you how to find, trace, and make minor modifications to the game's subroutines using the FCEUX debugger and hex editor tools. Before we begin, do me a favor by hitting the like button and subscribing to the channel. After that, we'll take a deep dive into how programs run on the NES. The NES is an 8-bit system based on the Rico 2A03, a second source variant of the MOS 6502 microprocessor. The 6502 was a popular processing unit in the late 70s and early 80s, as it was inexpensive, fast, and simple to use. As I've discussed in a previous video, a game's cartridge always contains a program ROM chip that it uses to store information for the game, including the game's machine code. This machine code, specifically 6502 machine code, is the program code for the game. It's what instructs the NES's processor and subsystems to make all of the sights, sounds, and interactions that you see when you run the game on a Nintendo or through an emulator. In the last episode, I explained that Final Fantasy's program ROM is split into a set of 16 sections called banks, and that these banks are mapped to the last 32 kilobytes of memory via the game's MMC1 mapper chip. The 6502 on the NES stores a special internal variable called the program counter, and this counter always contains a value that corresponds to an address in that last 32 kilobytes of memory. This is how the processor knows what instruction of the game's program to execute next. It literally reads the machine code directly from the mapped memory. Different sets of bytes in the machine code correspond to different basic instructions that can be executed by the 6502. These instructions can manipulate the flow of a program by modifying the program counter, perform arithmetic operations like addition and subtraction, and change values that are stored in the system's RAM. Ultimately, a game is just a giant run of these instructions that, if written correctly, produce a fun and interactive experience. Final Fantasy is, of course, no different than any other game in this regard. It's a very large collection of 6502 instructions that come together to make a game. And when I say large, I mean large. There's enough code here that it would take a single person quite a while to go through it all. Thankfully, a game's code is usually broken down into small chunks called subroutines that encapsulate some specific aspect of the game. For example, Final Fantasy has subroutines that handle things like the menus, the battle system, and even how shops work. So this is kind of what makes it possible for us to do ROM hacks. You don't need to know every last detail about a game's entire program, you just need to know where it does the specific things that you want to change. For the modifications I wanted to make, I needed to find various subroutines in the game's machine code related to shops and shopping. Since I hadn't hacked the Final Fantasy ROM before, I didn't really know where any of that code might be. But by using the various RAM locations that I showed how to find in the last episode, along with the FCE UX debugger, I was able to isolate the exact code I was interested in. The debugger is a tool that allows you to view machine code as human-readable assembly language while the game is running. You can use it to set up breakpoints that pause execution of the game when certain conditions are met, such as memory locations changing, and then step through the machine code one instruction at a time after the game has been paused. It even allows you to add your own labels, comments, and bookmarks that it stores in separate files alongside the ROM. This way, you can build up a more sensible understanding of the code as you trace it over multiple sessions. For the bulk buying hack, I needed to trace three key sections of the shop code that corresponded to the modifications that I wanted to make. 
First, I needed to find the code that handled the game logic right after the player selected an item. I wanted to add additional code here that would reset both the item quantity and total sale gold, as well as recalculate the maximum number of items that could be purchased. Next, I'd have to locate the code that handled user input when on the sale confirmation menu. I had to modify this code to also increase or decrease the quantity when the player pressed left or right on the D-pad. Finally, I'd have to trace the routine that handled the final sale for items in the game. This needed to be changed to take the quantity into account by adding the appropriate number of items and removing the correct amount of gold. This meant using the debugger to trace out program code that performed each of these actions, adding labels to all the important routines, and placing bookmarks so I could easily find the relevant code later. The actual process of tracing routines is somewhat mundane, so I won't go through each of the code paths here in detail. But for the sake of exposition, let's take a look at the way that I found the code that handled sale confirmation. Item shops in Final Fantasy use three major menus. The first gives the player the option to shop or leave, the second allows them to select an item from those that are available, and the third menu lets them confirm or cancel the sale. In order to trace the sale confirmation code, all I needed to do was set up a breakpoint that would pause the game at the very moment when a player confirmed that they wanted to buy an item. The way a player does this is by pressing the A button when the cursor is hovering over the Yes option on the third shop menu. I had worked out where the game stored data that showed which of the controller buttons were currently being pressed. And I had found a memory location that held one of three specific values depending on which shop menu was currently open. I had also determined that most of the shop code was on bank 0E, so I thought it was likely that this code would be there as well. The idea was to combine this information and build a breakpoint that would only pause the game if three very specific conditions were met. First, the A button on the controller was being pressed while the game was displaying the third menu. This is what initiated the action, and it was an obvious condition for the breakpoint. Second, the game was currently processing an instruction that was attempting to read the state of the controller. This is how the game would detect whether or not it needed to run the code that we were trying to find. And finally, that instruction resided on bank 0E, which meant it was likely part of the shop code. I added the breakpoint, and then I attempted to buy an item. This triggered the debugger to pause execution of the game, and I was golden. Well, almost. The debugger had stopped the game while it was processing controller input. Basically, the code at this point is checking to see if the A button is being pressed so that the game can decide what to do. All I had to do was follow along using the debugger, and it led me to the code that confirms the sale of the item. I had to trace the code a couple times because I got a little lost, but I eventually worked it out. After finding and tracing all of the relevant subroutines, I still wasn't 100% sure how I was going to make all the changes for the hack. Instead of trying to finish everything all at once, I decided to play around with the ROM a bit and see if I could make some minor adjustments to the shop code. I used a combination of SCEUX's debugger and hex editor to modify the machine code for the game. A hex editor is a program that displays the binary contents of a file as a series of hexadecimal numbers and allows you to directly edit the binary data by modifying these numbers. If you've never worked with binary or hexadecimal numbers before, I made a whole video about them and put a link down in the description. Remember, the data on the program ROM that represents the machine code for the game is just a big set of binary ones and zeros. When viewing the contents of the program ROM in a hex editor, all you see is a hexadecimal version of this binary data. This is why, when making modifications, the hex editor is best used in conjunction with a debugger, which can automatically translate those numbers into human-readable 6502 assembly. On the flip side, you still need to translate any new assembly code that you write into numeric machine code, so you can overwrite parts of the ROM. As it turns out, the tool that one uses to translate assembly into machine code is called an assembler. Now, there are a lot of different assemblers you can use, but for this video, I'll focus on using the FCEUX debugger's inline assembler. The inline assembler is a little gadget that lets you pick a spot in the ROM using the debugger enter some assembly code, and then replace the contents at that chosen location with the assembly code that you entered. Once you've entered some new code, you can use the hex editor to see the resulting numeric changes to the ROM file itself. 
Using the editor, you can save the changes or undo them if you're not happy with the result. One of the modifications that I had to make while playing around was to replace the game's code that handles adding items after a sale. The game is hard-coded to only add a single item, so I had to change it to be able to add any number of items based on a RAM location where I would be storing the quantity. This part of the code is kind of entwined with the part that checks to see if there's enough space in the player's inventory prior to adding any items or removing the gold. Both sections of code are right next to each other and fill 32 bytes of program ROM. I had intended to only change the code that added items, but since it was so close to the inventory space check, I decided to change both at the same time. As it turns out, it's actually easier to accomplish this. And to see why, let's take a look at how that code works. This is the assembly code that handles both the check and adding of items for the game. There's actually not a lot of code here, only 12 instructions. Roughly speaking, this constitutes a subroutine which is split into four logical sections. The first section checks the number of items in the player's inventory to determine how to proceed. If the player can't buy any more of the chosen item, then the game moves to section two which renders a message informing them of this fact and then exits the subroutine. If the player does have space, then the game proceeds to section three, which adds the item to their inventory and calls a subroutine to remove the gold. Then the game executes section four, which renders the success message and then exits the subroutine. The first section would need to be modified to take the quantity into account. The original code only checked if the player already had 99 of the chosen item in their inventory. My change would need to add the current inventory count to the selected quantity and then ensure that total didn't exceed 99. In section three, the original code uses a single increment instruction to add one to the count in the player's inventory. I'd need to replace this with a different instruction that instead stored the total that we had already calculated to that memory location. The change seemed relatively simple. I'd insert a couple of instructions to perform the addition operation in the first section, and then change the third section to store that result. Unfortunately, there was a problem. The new instructions that I was adding would require three additional bytes of program ROM space that I didn't have. Thankfully, I noticed that section two and section four were very similar. Each section uses the same two instructions to run a function that renders a message to the screen and then exits the overall subroutine. So I thought it might be possible to save a few bytes by eliminating this duplicate code. I started by shifting section two to the end of the subroutine. Then I replaced the last two instructions of section four with a single instruction that jumped to the correct spot in the code. This eliminated the redundancy by having the program just reuse the same two instructions. More importantly, it freed up three bytes, which was exactly what I needed to finish my changes. Next, I inserted the two instructions to perform the addition operation in the first section. After this, I changed the decision-making code so that it would prevent the sale if the resulting total exceeded 99. The last step was to change section four to store the total to the player's inventory. I was pretty happy with the final result, but I still needed to test it in order to make sure I didn't mess anything up. To do so, I used the cheats tool to set a dummy value for the quantity, bought a heal, and then checked the results in the RAM watch tool. Finally, I set a quantity that would exceed my available inventory space and then attempted to buy one more heal. This confirmed that the logic was right and the game displayed the correct message. So I think this is a good place to end the video. In this episode, I discuss some details on how programs run on the NES, introduced you to some techniques for tracing game routines, and showed you one way to make minor modifications to ROMs using FCE UX. Thanks for watching NES Hacker. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next part of my Final Fantasy shop hack. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.